Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday, time for another Ask Me Anything. I apologise if this one's a little bit late today. Uh, I've literally just been reminded by Deadly Custard on Twitter that it's Friday. Uh, I forgot all about it. So there we go. Uh, house admin, I don't think there is any because it's that sort of in-between week where... Uh, Christmas and New Year has taken over and everyone's now starting to get back to work even though it's Friday so yeah no update other than We Are Friends Volume 8 is out today so I'll drop a link below this video it's on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, all the usual places check it out um, so straight on with it Unknown artist, uh, hey buddy, hope you had a good Christmas and New Year. First of all, when you decide to do a small tour, remember to let us know the details. Absolutely. Uh, question this time around is, whenever I create something, I find most of my ideas sound similar. They have differences, obviously, but they all sort of run along the same lines of sound. I find it pretty hard to go against the grain. Uh, I would like to go to say this is my foundation and stick to it be good to hear if you and everyone else has this feeling about their own stuff um yeah well I mean I guess we we all sort of naturally find something that works for us and something that appeals to us and I think if that appeals to other people as well then stick to it uh I know my own stuff probably all sounds quite similar uh and I think there's an importance in that, in a sort of uh, a sense of familiarity, I suppose, to the listener. Um, you know, if, for example, you were to hear that Hans Zimmer released a new EP and it was death metal, um, I think a lot of people would be very annoyed you know no matter how good the death metal was you know that's not what people were expecting so I think it's always worth bearing that in mind but at the same time you've also got to be careful that it doesn't stop you evolving as an artist and that's possibly a more important factor so where for example you know if you listen to all of my tracks for the last three or four years they 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 all sound somewhat similar certainly in sound design and production technique um but then go back further before there and there's probably another two or three years where they sound different to the current batch but similar to each other at that time period so i hope that you know if you trace all of my music back you can sort of hear there's an evolution throughout and every now and then there's a, a bit of a change in style or technique or theme or sound design or whatever and I think that's probably almost more important in, at times that you know listeners want a sense of familiarity but also as a producer you want to evolve and develop new skills and techniques um, otherwise you know you end up as one of those sort of copy pasta producers and uh, you know there's nothing in that well, maybe there's some money in it I don't know but that, there's certainly no art in it uh, so yeah uh, Finn Fighter hi Dom do you know where you can find cheap orchestral sounds violin piano etc I don't have money to buy complete 12 so need to find a cheaper solution uh, funny enough I've been talking about Spitfire Audio Labs recently uh, I've got into that and I'm slowly sort of learning orchestral expressions now the labs stuff is free so if you google Spitfire Audio Labs uh, that stuff is free there are some very usable strings in there and some choir sounds um, there's another one called Frozen Strings, which I quite like. Um, but if you're going for a traditional orchestra sound, maybe they're not the ones to go for. Um, 
And if I'm totally honest though, I would say there's no such thing as a cheap or free realistic orchestra sound. Um, you know, if you're wanting real stuff, then, you know, you need to look at, well, I mean, Spitfire Audio, I think, are probably some of the best. Um, and they do things like Albion One, which is not cheap, but probably worth every penny. Um, so there's that. Um, Kavoke has replied saying, honestly, mate, give Spitfire Audio Labs libraries a try. Uh, they are beyond belief for free ones. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there are a few strings, piano, electric piano, and some other interesting ones. Uh, more keep getting added every month. Definitely worth a try at least. For strings, just remember to use expression CC. Uh, it makes the world a difference. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I've been sort of practicing on labs is because they allow you to... Um, modulate the expression using a mod wheel um, so if you imagine a, a violinist you know sort of presses slightly harder as the bow goes down um, you know you'd, you'd slowly slide the mod wheel up with that and that's really what you're looking for and then before a note change to bring it back down slightly um, so that it has a more natural sound and and I think this is why free orchestra sample libraries are pretty much no good because something like a violin sound for example sounds very different at every level of intensity and so it's about layering those samples at different velocities um, you know it's not just a case of loudness it's it's a very different sounding instrument when it's played softly compared to when it's played you know full whack um, and to make those sample libraries work is painstaking so um, you'd be hard pressed to find any free or particularly cheap ones that sounded good or, or realistic to be honest. Um, Outsider, hi Dom, uh, hope you and your loved ones had a great new year, wishing you all well for the rest of it. Thank you very much. Yes we did. Uh, not a terribly geeky question but I've noticed I think that you use an audience interface. I do. Uh, I've been through loads of reviews and I'm thinking of getting the ID22. Which model is yours and are they as absolutely amazing as people reviewing them make, out, make them out to be? Uh, I've not seen the reviews, if I'm honest, uh, but that's the ID22. Uh, I know they've got a 44 out now, which is cool. Um, I've got two mics or two DIs in, or a stereo in. Um, I've also got optical in which runs through ADAT so it's got expansion uh, and yeah, I mean for me I'd like to say I, I, from what you're saying the reviews are great and I would add to that yeah they're, they're um, super transparent basically um, and that's the beauty of them the, the digital to analog conversion is, is crystal clear um, and I think I mean they're almost underpriced, to be honest. Uh, I, I know when I first bought mine, I remember thinking that that can't be that good for for that price, and it really is. Yeah, so you get way more bang for buck through the audience system than anything I've ever witnessed, um, because they easily compete with interfaces that are, I mean, literally at least ten times the price. Um, so yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, Monosum and polarity reverse assignable to the F keys sounds like a great feature. Yes, it absolutely is, uh, especially when you're mixing and mastering. Um, I can just hit F1 and it'll go to mono, and then I can hit F2 and it'll switch polarity so I can hear just the, the stereo signal. Um, <clears throat> and that can be brilliant for if, for example, you're, you, I don't know, you're working on a master, for example, and you just want to hear something in the vocal, you can just flip the polarity um, and you're left with pretty much just the vocal so yeah that is great uh, not sure if I'd be using the ID mixer for much though uh, so the software that it comes with obviously I th I, I'm assuming you have to install it to run um, as an interface um, yeah I don't touch it at all I have everything flat um, because obviously I use the workstation so yeah, but it comes with it, so it is what it is. 
Uh, Andrew Hollis, wishing you and your loved ones a peaceful and prosperous 2019. Thank you, you too. Uh, I have seen uh, over a social media post that Beringer have acquired a few pieces of classic gear from Tears for Fears live rig. Hmm. No doubt the plan is to remodel the kit for the masses. I think Beringer get a bad rep for cloning the classic synths that are out of the price range for Joe Public. If the Model D is good enough for Kenny Larkin, then it's all right with me. Uh, surely it allows people to take classic synth sound to the road without risking destroying a synth costing thousands of pounds. Yeah, good point. Um, uh, yeah, I think they probably get more of a bad rep than they deserve. Um, you know, when it comes to some of the more simple things like the patch bays and even the MIDI controllers, is it the BCR 2000, I think I had for a while, which had some infinite rotary dials and faders and whatever, just as a MIDI controller. <clears throat> I mean, it was rock solid. It went round the world with me several times over and never failed me, you know. Um, so I, I don't think they aim to make the, you know, the, they're not in the same league as someone say like Moog or someone like that you know they're not handcrafted wooden panels or whatever but they serve a, they serve a purpose and they do it very well for a good price so I, I've got no complaints over bearing a stuff um, enough already my question if money was no object which hardware synth would you like to own and design for and which synth no amount of money would get you to work on it uh, <laughs> Right now, I would say the the synth that is playing on my mind the most is the Moog One. Um, so, if budget was no issue, <clears throat> I'd have a, a whole stack of them. Um, no, I, I'd have one of those. Um, as for a synth, I wouldn't work on. I can't think of one right now. There have been a couple that I have turned down. I would rather not name those companies because I don't think it was necessarily their fault. Um, I think they were just rookie mistakes from a, a manufacturing point of view. Uh, there's been a couple that I've had that uh, I've agreed to work on and then been sent the product and then the product has arrived and I've looked at it and gone or played with it and gone, oh, this is a horrendous menu system the the dials are falling apart and you've priced it with the likes of you know huge legendary synths and you're not offering that standard of quality so um, there's been a couple where I've had to turn down for those sorts of reasons where I just wouldn't want my name attached to that because I didn't think they'd quite nailed what they felt they had um, and I felt like the people buying those machines would be the ones that were disappointed and and would have felt like they've wasted a lot of money and that's not that's not something i want to be a part of um you know i i, I don't make particularly much money in this industry does anyone um but i like to think that all the money i do make is honest money so yeah um but i'm not going to call them out on it um, I can also see, annoyingly, my battery I didn't change just before I hit record on this, so I'm just going to swap the battery over before I get on to the next question. So I'll see you in a second. That's better. I could see uh, <clears throat> it was flashing on the screen and I was a bit concerned it was going to run out halfway through a sentence. Right, uh, where did I get to? Uh, Andrew Hollis, right, answered that one. Uh, Deb Marcinko, uh, hey Dom, uh, sorry I'm kind of late to this video, I had a bad week, my grandmother passed away, yeah I read that and I'm sorry to hear that mate, uh, so I was away making music and from my computer as well, fair enough. Uh, my question, if I'm making music with my headphones and not the speakers, what is the best way to check if the mix sounds good? So basically if the mix sounds amazing on my producing headphones and sounds good but not amazing on my mobile regular headphones, what should I do to make it sound amazing on both of them and also on speakers? <sighs> That's a really difficult question. 
because there's no easy answer. I guess it's just a case of... Well, I guess it depends on what, what sounds, which bit sounds good and which bit sounds bad and for what reason. And I guess that's something only you can find the answers to. So let's say, for example, your production headphones are probably the most reliable headphones. Um, and let's say, for example, everything sounds good and clean on that. And then you zap it onto your mobile phone and you put on those, you know, your earbuds or whatever. And let's say it sounds too muddy in that. Uh, then you need to find um, what the reason is for that muddy sound. And, and I think that's the hardest part is, is it your mobile phone earphones that sound muddy? Or is it a problem with your production headphones that make things sound too clean? Um, I'm going to guess that it would probably be more the production headphones make things sound a bit too clean rather than the other way around. Um, and I don't know how you get around that. I mean, I guess you've just got to try it on even more sound systems and, and go with the average so if for example if you can test it in the car you know on your mum's hi-fi on your friend's hi-fi uh, in your friend's car and just keep testing it and, and also find a track that you know and love that sounds somewhat similar so you know if it's a house track then find another house track that you know is really well produced that has a similar kind of instrumentation or something you would expect to have the same frequencies basically um, and listen to that and then listen to yours on all of those as many systems as you can um, and maybe make a note on each one and then try another track of yours and do the same again comparing it to the same other track um, and just keep going around all of those because it's only by doing that you're going to be able to work out which sound systems offer which advantages and disadvantages and then where your music stands relative to those things I suppose uh, so that's a tricky one uh, I can see there's three replies to that though uh, oh that's me that's fine uh, Cavacate uh, short but sweet this week sorry for not adding a question last time all got a bit crazy over Christmas yeah it was I think it was only like five minutes last week um, and yeah I, I was kind of expecting that because uh, Christmas and New Year and I was kind of expecting this one to be a bit short as well uh, I'll rewatch last week's uh, try to remember what question I was going to ask then add it below okay cheers uh, you didn't know did you <laughs> uh, Zombo uh, what are your thoughts on the new Massive X plugin oh I saw this comment come in and I forgot to look uh, so I don't have any thoughts yet um, I haven't even looked at it uh, Massive X let's have a look now and I massive X. Okay. So now from the creators of the original instrument comes a brand new synth Massive X with a next generation sound engine, state of the art components and new effects. Massive X will ensure your music stays on the cutting edge for the next decade. Okay, that doesn't really tell us anything. If you own Complete 12, it's a free download. I don't know if I've got 12, I think I'm on 11. It will exist side by side with the original instrument. Okay, so it's an entirely new version, I guess. Watch here. Let's have a look. Can you see my screen? Just about. OK, 
okay that sounds like some additive synthesis going on huh okay they're not telling us much are they god i feel like a real youtuber there doing a don kane reacts to video um okay i'll look into that a bit more I, i'm i'm liking what i heard from what i did hear there i don't know if that came across on the microphone uh in fact i've noticed my microphone seems to be getting quieter and quieter at the moment i don't know why that is um yeah so okay i mean massive was a, a staple for many many years for a lot of producers so if they're going to be doing massive x then they better be doing something really special um i might see if i can get a cheeky preview of that um from the sounds i heard and again i had got my volume down somewhat low so i wasn't paying too much attention but it did sound like some additive synthesis going on um for some reason my ears pick out these things there's like a little I, I can't i mean i think we can we can all tell the difference between an fm synth and a subtractive synth in terms of sound and sound quality and the way they produce a sound um additive has a certain texture to it as well that i i can't quite put my finger on but i, I felt like i heard that in there which will be interesting if it if it has an additive engine uh then that's huge because i'm a big big fan of additive sounds so fingers crossed and that's what it is uh right where did i get to uh gg11 will you do a making a track start to finish live stream um when i've finished building my next studio if i ever get round to it um <clears throat> then I intend on it. I'm at, so at the moment with this YouTube channel. I mean, the, these AMAs are basically just carrying it at the moment, um, <clears throat> which I'm eternally grateful for and I enjoy. So let's put that out there. Um, my plan is I would like to start doing some laid back interviews with other producers especially now that i'm in manchester which is home to a lot of other good producers um i'd quite like to sort of set up a an interview style me and someone sat on a couch just having a chat basically talking industry stuff um and off the back of that clearly I need a second camera and I've been looking at that and I have seen a couple that also offer live stream capabilities so if I move ahead with that and get the new studio built then yes there's a good chance I'll probably start doing some live stream stuff um, tracks maybe not start to finish all in one stream because that's not how my day works but I'll probably end up doing something along those lines anyway um, as for walkthrough tutorials I am definitely planning on doing a couple more for Sonic Academy at the moment um, I've actually just pieced together some notes on a couple of my tracks that will hopefully come out later this year and I'm hope I'm already sort of because I've noticed in those tracks that I've done some certain things where I think oh, actually that might make a good tutorial so again keep your eyes, eyes peeled there <clears throat> um, and Zombo again Merry Christmas to you too Dom uh, what are like your must-have VST plugins or hardware that you cannot or do not want to produce music without first and foremost my sub 37 is is just everything to me uh, it's even though it doesn't necessarily always end up on every track I do, it is still definitely the most enjoyable experience and that makes it a pleasure to write lead melodies and bass lines with and just to I, I enjoy the whole creative experience between Bitwig and the Sub 37. I get the most pleasure in just being creative with, with leads and bass lines and you know sometimes the sub 37 might get replaced with a digital synth because the track takes a different direction or whatever but i would say the sub 37 hands down 
is my my absolute favorite synth uh vst plugins um i'm not sure i think both x first serum and sonic academy's anna 2 are probably my most used um they're kind of my go-to synths just because i think because i worked on both of them from day one i kind of had to learn them inside out so um i think it, you know as as much as they're both great synths and i would recommend either to anyone um i think i'm also a stickler for sticking to what i know and i know those two very well um so that's that <clears throat> and deadly custard who is the one who reminded me that it's friday so thank him for me doing this video today uh hey dom congrats on the waf 008 release yes we are friends eight is out now so i'll link below that in this video sounding great uh you're in good company there with a couple of great tracks either side of you i did notice that i did listen to those uh seems like the d's is where the party starts to kick off anyway to my question white noise mainstay of the techno house producer who doesn't like a sweep or a noise fill good question I'm wondering if you could do a video at some point specifically about noise and how and when to think about using it. Seems to me something that is not quite as straightforward as you'd think. Yes, good idea. I will do that because there are a couple of different tricks that I like to do with white noise. I may have covered one or two before. Not sure. Either way, I'll do a I'll do a I'll do a video specifically on white noise and its uses and a, a couple of little tricks because there are some things like rendering it down to audio and adding chorus effects, uh, sweeping with filters, both high pass and low pass at various stages, and then you've got the ultimate trick of silence inside white noise sweeps. Um, so yeah, there's lots that you can do. And of course, things like LFOs and creating your own hi-hats and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a stack of stuff you could do with white noise. So I will do my very best to get into that uh, as soon as I can. It's probably not going to be straight away because we've just had Christmas New Year. And I've got lots of uh, project stuff to crack on with at the moment. Um, which is why I forgot it was even Friday and forgot to do this video. So... Uh, on that bombshell thank you very much for watching and uh yeah i hope you've all had a good christmas and new year and i hope you are all painfully making your way back into work now at least it's friday so you got the weekend um and i'm gonna say let's have another keyword so if you have made it this far into the video then comment the word event to let me know that you've made it this far in and I'll see you next Friday, if I don't forget. Cheers.